In my last lecture, I reported on important changes in family life. Changes that combined with economic restructuring have put tremendous pressure on working families to juggle both work and family demands. Now a lot of this pressure is due to women's increased labor force participation, which has reduced the amount of time that women can devote to the household. As a result, men have begun to put more hours into domestic chores and child care. And women have had to take on enormous work hours, both providing for their family financially and still taking on the bulk of the domestic work. In short, today's families are pressed for time in a way that we really haven't seen in recent history. And as I'll suggest in this lecture, there's very little social support for these working families as they juggle work and family demands. I pointed out in my last lecture that women's labor force participation has been steadily on the rise since the early 1900s. Now we saw a temporary reversal in this trend in the aftermath of World War II when economic growth and relatively high wages allowed men to support a stay-at-home wife. But by the, the 1970s, women's employment was again steadily on the rise. Indeed, starting in the 1970s, women's work became critical to household survival. Um, due to a recession, very high rates of inflation, and declining earnings for men, women were, were sent out into the workforce to help contribute to the family income. So you'll see from the graph um, that women's labor force participation has been rising steadily, but then in the 1970s it shoots upward and increases quite dramatically. Um, in 1950, 34% of women ages 16 and over participated in the labor force. By 2005, that percentage had risen to just under 60. A lot of this increase is due to the increased labor force participation of married women with children. Now these are precisely uh, uh, the women that would have dropped out of the labor force once they married or had children in previous generations. Um, so in 1950, around 18% of married mothers were in the labor force. By 2005, that percentage had risen to just under 70%. So now that women are in the workforce, who's doing the cooking, cleaning, and childcare? Well, studies suggest that as women's labor force participation increases, the hours that they spend in cooking and cleaning tend to decrease, um, although their hours spent in childcare remain more or less the same. At least this is what we saw in the time period between 1965 and 1998. During that same time frame, men's paid work slightly decreased to an increase in male unemployment, um, but they spent greater time on household chores like cooking and cleaning and on caring for children. For example, men's cooking and cleaning time increased from a mere 17 minutes a day in 1965 to 46 minutes a day in 1998. Even so, in 1998, women still did two times as much cooking and three times as much child care um, as men. As well, men had about 30 minutes more of leisure time than women. So it appears that there's both a gender gap in uh, domestic work and a gender gap in free time. The long hours that workers are putting in at work and the demands of family life mean that they are increasingly squeezed for time, what uh, Kathleen Gerson and Jerry Jacobs call the work-home crunch. Now Gerson and Jacob um, find that the share of working men who are working 50 or more hours a week rose from 21% in 1970 to 27% in 2000. Uh, the share of working women who were working 50 or more hours a week uh, rose from 5 to 11 percent in that same time frame. As well, households are increasingly headed by two working parents or a single working parent. As Gerson and, and Jacobs explain, a 60-hour work week for a father means something entirely different depending on whether the mother stays at home or also works a 60-hour work week. In 1970, 33% of all married families had two wage earners, compared to 60% in 2000. 
In 2000, women-headed households uh, represented 20% of all households, which was a two-fold increase of, uh, in female-headed households since 1970. In the case of both dual earner and single parent households, there's not as much time to spend with children and tend to critical family needs, like making doctor's appointments or cooking nutritious meals. Um, men no longer enjoy the advantages of a stay-at-home wife. You know, they don't get to come home to a warm-cooked meal. Uh, um, they don't have the assurance that their children are getting the best possible care. And working women are even more disadvantaged because, of course, they're working a full day to provide for their families and then coming home to shoulder the bulk of the domestic work, what many have called women's second shift. Working parents then, and especially working mothers, are, simply put, time starved. So what kind of support do we offer working parents? A 1997 study suggested that large firms, most large firms, offer some kind of family benefit, whether that's a child care services or maternity leave. But the study showed that when you factor in small firms, or those firms with less than 100 employees, only a minority of companies offer family benefits. Moreover, informal pressures discourage workers, and especially working fathers, from taking advantage of family benefits when they do exist. In the United States, the only federal policy we have to really help working parents is called the Family and Medical Leave Act. The FMLA was passed in 1993, and it basically guarantees that workers who work for a company with 50 or more employees can get up to 12 weeks of unpaid family leave to care for a newborn child or a sick family member. Unfortunately, in 2005, only 67% of men and 56% of women were employed by eligible companies. And only around 8 to 17% of those who were eligible actually took the leave because most couldn't afford to take unpaid leave for that amount of time. By all accounts, the U.S. lags far behind most middle and high income countries in the provision of family leave. In Sweden, for example, women get over a year of paid maternity leave. As well, parents, both mothers and fathers, of any child under the age of eight can opt for a six-hour workday with a proportional decline in pay. Even a new mom in Chile, a developing country in South America, offers women 18 weeks of paid maternity leave. fix the work family crunch. Gerson and Jacob suggest reducing the standard work week so that we would uh, um, on average work fewer hours a week. This would reduce working hours for all people but would especially alleviate that time squeeze for working parents. Now most surveys suggest that men and women would prefer to work between 30 and 40 hours a week, um, suggesting that long work hours are a major stress for both men and women. Another suggestion that Gerson and, and Jacobs make is to expand the options for affordable quality child care. Now, currently the U.S. allows some child care tax credits, um, but beyond this, there has been little in the way to reduce the um, high financial cost that child care entails. Um, child care on average costs uh, families around $1,000 a month when you're looking at child care for children under the age of five. Finally, the National Partnership for Women and Families advocates an expansion of family leave. And they offer two suggestions to this end, either um, using a temporary disability insurance system or using the existing unemployment insurance system to basically provide workers paid family leave. Now, five states have already pursued the temporary disability insurance program, um, and since 2000, the U.S. Department of Labor has permitted states to offer the second option, that is, allowing workers to take unemployment um, while they're out on family leave. This is a practice that's known as baby UI, or baby unemployment insurance. Um, so one option here is to encourage states to pursue one of these two options. In general, there are great options out there to reduce the work-family crunch. 
there's certainly a critical need uh, for these options. What's needed really is, is the political will or the compassion to say that children deserve parents and that parents deserve help. That makes sense not simply for working families, but for society as a whole. Thank you.